Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> One thing for sure, you don't want me to sing to you. I can tell you, show you that. <laughs> but I do hope that I can uh, make this evening a bit enjoyable for you just to uh, relive the election a little bit. But as you see from the title here, we're already on to 2016. And many of the things that happened in Florida with last year's election have raised new questions about what 2016 presidential race will look like. And of course, if you're looking at the slide here, you see already the candidates that are being talked about for potential uh, presidential candidates on both sides of the aisle uh, next time out. Uh, just a little bit of a reminder here about the election. You see that uh, Electoral College votes, it was very much of a, a, a victory for the president, but the popular vote itself was very narrow, 4%, which was actually a lot smaller than it was the first time. So that's changed a little bit in terms of the president asking and saying he has a mandate. He uses the Electoral College as the basis, and for those who say he didn't really have a mandate, they go for the popular vote. Just a little bit of the configuration of what the president is dealing with right now and the, what's happening in Washington. It reminds you of the fact that it's a very close um, configuration of each chamber of the U.S. Congress, and the Democrats hold the upper hand in the Senate, but they have 33 seats to defend this next time out. Uh, and then, of course, you see the House of Representatives uh, then the Republican hand narrowly. So the, the ones in the top are already running for re-election. And we have a third of the Senate up for, for re-election. But anyway, just to go back a little bit here and remind ourselves of what, what it was uh, heading into the fall. We were, from the get-go, seen as one of the toss-up states, and that never changed from start to finish, really. And we're going to look at some of the reasons why that's the case but there was never a doubt, and of course, if you look at the fact that we have 29 electoral college votes, and we had more than any other swing state, and what a lot of people didn't realize was actually Florida had the same number of electoral college votes as the state of New York. So we were tied for third for the most electoral college votes. And there were some key reasons why uh, Florida was so big on the national stage. These haven't changed a bit. Our racial and ethnic makeup look more like the country uh, as a whole than any other state. And in an election year where many people described it as Democrat, demographics as destiny, well, Florida led the way in that prediction, which was why we were considered a bellwether state from the beginning. And something else about Florida, which you can see right here in this area, excuse me, my microphone's falling down here just a minute. Let me fix it. But uh, you see that we have also the three key geographies that are important in how candidates and parties figure out how to reach voters. Florida has, again, just like the nation at large, uh, the percentage mix of rural, urban, and suburban that you see nationally. And in our state, of course, the rural areas tend to be more Republican, conservative, the urban areas more Democrat, and the suburban areas in our state have been and will be the key swing part. And we were watching those very carefully as analysts uh, on election night, particularly, I'll come back to that more. And another thing that we have that, again, surprises many people, we have a very diverse age composition. I have to tell you that at the beginning of last year, when we had the GOP primary, in Florida, we leapfrogged ahead, you remember that. Well, we had debates in Tampa, and we had 38 international journalists sharing our um, station, broadcasting from there. And there were two things about Florida that they had in their minds that I just laughed about. One is that everybody in Florida is 95 years of age or older. <laughs> and the second is that every Hispanic is Cuban and votes Republican. Well, we in Florida knew that wasn't true, but we had to educate the world, and we did. Uh, certainly, we have the most party competitive state in the country, of uh, the big states in particular, Texas, solidly red, California, New York, solidly blue, and here's purple Florida, and we were uh, very, very competitive. We also have a lot of deep pockets, uh, rich people in Florida that like to give money to campaigns on both sides of the aisle. 
And finally, and this is what makes campaigning so expensive in our state, we have 10 media markets, and some of them are huge. My market, the Tampa market, is Florida's largest market. 25% of all of our registered voters live in our market. But moving on here a little bit, you know, heading into last year, and we'll do the same thing in 2016, there's a tendency to always look back four years prior and try to superimpose that kind of politics into the current mix, but it didn't work in Florida in 2010 or 2012. Why? Because we'd seen a lot of demographic shifts. We got two more Congress members as a consequence of the 2010 census. The campaign finance laws changed. Uh, you've heard the term super PAC. In fact, super PAC was selected by Webster Dictionary as a new term to put in this year. Super PACing can be described as a verb. It means drowning somebody in money, either one way or another, and not really often not knowing who is doing it. Um, and of course, redistricting, we saw very different uh, people running for different congressional district configurations, state legislative. Media habits of uh, voters in, in all over the country changed, uh, and it'll be different next time out this year. Um, it was more you know, focused on uh, smartphones, and four years prior it was something different. But nothing really describes what was different this last year than the last one. The cynical mood of the electorate, and it hasn't changed a bit. I just got back from Europe on Monday. I went over there for the U.S. State Department to talk about our elections. And one of the things Europeans found very interesting is the fact that Americans still have a lot of distrust in government. And the Europeans kind of shook their heads and said, oh, really? Because they don't get that in their news media. But it's all over the world. And of course, a lot of it's tied to the economy, as we'll look at. Well, certainly going into the election, this is my favorite cartoon of the whole time. We knew Florida was going to be a swing state, and that purple area down the middle is the I-4 corridor, and I love it. It says TV saturation bombing, and believe me, it absolutely was. It never, never stopped. But just to give you a bit of a feel for the competitiveness of our state, there was only a 4% difference in Democrats and Republicans in registration and a hefty percent, 21 percent, are NPAs or no party affiliation, and you got three percent. Others like the Libertarians, the Surfer Party, yes we have a Surfer Party in Florida. <laughs> My students are very interested in that one. Until I show them only six people belong to it, then you know, <laughs> not so much. But anyway, uh, this just shows you again the competitiveness of our state relative to others, and both parties fought hard for it, as you know. It is also the case, going to the point I started out initially talking about, the diversity, the racial and ethnic diversity of Florida really was extremely interesting to the nation at large. And again, I say that's one of the reasons that people always look at Florida as a leading predictor of what the rest of the country is going to look like, whatever demographic you're talking about. But it was the case that uh, one third of Florida's registered voters were non-whites. And you see, it's kind of interesting because much was made of the Hispanic proportion of our population, 14%. But it, it got a lot more attention. But the truth of the matter was, that, and is, that 14% of our registered voters are African American or Caribbean black. So we had two very sizable racial groups. And they were a key part of the targeting of the parties, and then of course one of the fastest growing areas, though still small, is uh, the Asian population in Florida. But here's the diverse age composition that again shocks a lot of people. But if you add together the um, under 30 and 30 to 49 year olds, you'll see they make up 48 percent of our registered voters, and over 50, 52 percent, with the largest single group being the 30 to 49 year olds. And one of the things that we saw, again, Florida way ahead of the country, we were writing about it as analysts way before the election was over about the generational divide politically in our state. And I'll come back more to that a little bit later. And of course, in Florida, as nationally, women do rule. <laughs> it's Valentine's Day, OK? But you do see that 53% of our registered voters are female. Now, I know some of you are statisticians, and you're going to look at that green sliver there, and you're going to say, who doesn't know what gender they are, OK? 
this is an artifact of the way that the uh, Division of Elections reports registration data. You don't have to give this, and so there's that. They want to get 100%, so the green is there. Now, when I'm asking my college students, you know, they look at this and start laughing. I say, well, what is unknown? And they say, well, both, all the above, neither, you know, they, they can fill in the blanks. But anyway, aside from that. Uh, this is a little bit of something that I think a lot of the general public in Florida doesn't quite get about our state is the diversity and the size and number of our media markets. You know, there are states, many states, that only have one media market. So you get an appreciation for why it costs so much to run here. And it, one, keeping one ad up in all 10 markets for one week was estimated to be around $2 million this last election. So when you talk about why you're going to raise a lot of money, well, there you go. And in terms of the biggest media market is Tampa, followed by Miami, followed by Orlando. So that I-4 corridor is why, um, why we focus so much on it is because for years now, it has been a perfect predictor of pretty much how the state's going. And it was again this year. But going into the election, this was what we were seeing was that the I-4 corridor was going to be the battleground yet again. And technically, you are part of the I-4 corridor market and that you're part of the Orlando market, I believe. So here, this shows you 44% of all of Florida's resident registered voters were in the, those two markets of Tampa and Orlando. Think of it, almost half of the state in those two markets. And so if you looked at where the candidates went when they came into our state, it would always be one of these two markets, sometimes both, and then they'd either head south to South Florida or north to Jacksonville. And that was pretty much the pattern of where they went. Now, why it's important, and looking ahead to 2016, markets are how the politicians and the parties look at a state. They really don't focus that much on county by county. They look at it from this perspective because that determines where they're going to buy ads and where they're going to send their candidates and surrogates to get the most media attention. And this is something, again, that Florida is very difficult to traverse because we have such a difference in the, the makeup of our different markets. But anyway, to start looking ahead a little bit, just to remind you of what the presidential election map looked like, and you see that two southern states stayed blue, Virginia and Florida, um, but North Carolina went red. They were blue in 2008. I can tell you on election night, and I'm sitting in the television station, this was the nightmare map for me because I lived through 2000. It was Florida wasn't called, wasn't called, wasn't called, wasn't called. And of course, all of us know that there's a lot of reasons why people give for us taking four days to figure out who really won Florida. The good news was that Romney could see he wasn't going to win, and he conceded. But the reality of this is that Florida was absolutely the closest state of all 50. 0.9% was all that differentiated the president from Governor Romney in Florida. 74,000 votes out of 8.5 million was all the difference there was. And we are going to be like this again in 2016 because Florida remains the best single microcosm of the United States at large of any state, big or small. So let's take a look at what we saw in Florida that is already affecting the discussions and debates among the strategists and party activists. And let's start with the primary debates. You remember, they, of course, President Obama didn't have to go through a primary, but uh, he had to go through a big one in 2008. So he was very happy to stand back and say, let the Republicans have their fun this time. And you see how many candidates there were in the primary. And uh, a little bit later, we'll talk about the presidential debates themselves as opposed to primary. Uh, and I'll remind you of how many people stood on this stage in Florida. Of course, we, you can see over time that there were 27 televised GOP presidential debates nationally. 
They started, look where they started. The first one was in May of 2011. So if you thought you were weary of last year's election, <laughs> yes, you were, because it started way before that. And of course, Florida was a central campaign location for everybody. And we, of course, were one of the top four states for having presidential debates here, televised debates, South Carolina, New Hampshire, and Iowa. Those two, of course, you, the New Hampshire and Iowa, you understand that South Carolina was uh, ahead of us, and then we went next. So we had many, many debates here. Uh, and there were 39 states that didn't have a one. So we saw some things here that um, are affecting how we're looking at primaries. And of course, one of the questions that's been raised, and it sort of is raised every four years, is it better to front load your primaries or to string them out a little bit longer? In 2008, Hillary and Obama went at it almost to the end. They had Their primaries were strung out. Remember the 2008 convention, there was even some thought that Hillary might be able to pull it off, and uh, that didn't happen. But this time, there was a lot of speculation that it was going to be a brokered convention, meaning that we wouldn't know when it got to Tampa who was going to be the GOP nominee. Well, that quickly got dispelled. But the point of the front-loaded versus stringing them out, people who are in favor of front-loading say, get it over with and let the candidate who's cleared all this start saving and raising money for the general election. On the other hand, those who say, no, string it out, because if you don't, you can nominate somebody early on that turns out to be not who you'd like to have as your party's nominee. But the relevant concern for what Florida did, this is twice in a row now, Florida and Michigan have raised the question yet anew about, is it smart to start out this whole primary season with two states, Iowa and New Hampshire, who are extremely unrepresentative of the rest of the country. They're very rural, they're very Anglo, and this is why big states again, Michigan and Florida twice, they did it in 08 and 2012 both, looked at the situation and the parties in those two states said, you know what, this is not good. We are going to leapfrog ahead. We're not going to go in the order that the primaries tell us we have to do, even if it means losing delegates at the national convention, which did happen. And so even now the governor of Iowa has said it's not a great thing to have this thing called the Iowa straw poll, if you remember that. It's a fair-like thing. You can pay people to come in and vote. It's a little strange, but anyway. That doesn't sound good, but you know what I'm saying. It's, it's an affair, and it's, it's, you know, it's an informal kind of thing. But as he pointed out, it costs millions for both parties to play in the straw poll and the candidates. And yet, it doesn't really even ensure that the person that wins this straw poll in Iowa is even going to win the primary or the caucus when you have that. If it had been the case that the straw poll voter winner in Iowa would have been the nominee, it would have been Michelle Bachman. So again, the diversity of America, the growing um, racial and ethnic mix, and big states looking at this, there's a lot of pressure to reform the idea of starting with Iowa and New Hampshire. Now the answer to the next one is also debated, but you absolutely know the answer to this one. And it has a meaning for next time out. It was true that President Obama's campaign didn't have to spend a penny on opposition research. Oppo research is when you try to find everything bad about a candidate because Romney's opponents in the GOP did it for the president. <laughs> and when you had, think of it, Romney had been through 20 televised debates before he was ever nominated. So if there was any blemish, it was already out there. Think of it, next time out though, we're likely to have competitive primaries in both parties. There's no incumbent next time. So this may be really interesting. Cable television may be the loser on this front because I don't think you're going to see 
either party really wanting to jump in and have all these televised debates, knowing how much it did in Governor Romney this year's cycle. So I'm, I'm guessing the answer to the next question, will there be fewer primary TV debates in 2016 to be very much the affirmative, there probably will be fewer. So let's move from the primaries to the national party conventions. Again, Florida raised a lot of issues that uh, are now being discussed by both parties. And of course, one was in Tampa, the other in North Carolina, and both parties thought that they would pick a state that they needed to win. And so the president thought he won North Carolina in 2008, that North Carolina was turning blue, and that if he could win it again by having the convention there, it would sy symbolize the growing change in the South more towards the Democrats. The Republicans thought, on the other hand, win Florida. They knew they had to have Florida to get the nominate to, to win the presidency. And so they picked Tampa, the state's largest media market, and the most divided. And by the way, I didn't mention this, but the I-4 corridor itself, Tampa plus Orlando, the breakdown of registered voters heading into the election, 38% Democrat, 38% Republican, and the rest independent. So, you know, it's just a, 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 just a competitive state. We know that. But the questions now, and site selection is always competitive, and um, the parties are starting to rethink conventions a little bit because it's been a while now since the parties have selected a state that actually helps their party win a state for their convention. Secondly, uh, you're going to see a rethinking of scheduling the conventions in midsummer or late summer. I don't think you're going to see another late summer convention. Not just because of hurricanes, <laughs> you know, but also because Romney was terribly disadvantaged by the rules which said that you cannot officially get the money that you're due for the general election phase of the campaign until you've been officially nominated. And he was not nominated till late August, which let Obama, who had no opposition, run ads branding Romney badly the whole summer. So uh, that's the issue on that one. Tampa also raised the security issue. And let me assure you, both parties were worried about anarchists at the conventions. And Tampa ended up looking like somewhat of a fortress to people outside of Florida. But the reasons why the security was so tight in Tampa was multifaceted. One, of course, was the fact that they were projecting 2,000 anarchists to descend upon Tampa because Tampa's convention was before college classes started. And Florida is kind of a nice place to come, even though I don't know August is hot for some people. but. Uh, but the other thing that was more important was CENTCOM. You know, Central Command is at MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa. So the bottom line was the security folks nationally were helping the security people in Tampa, and it really cost a lot more money, caused the city not to have as nice of image as they would like to have had. And I don't think you're going to see now, next time out, the other problem with, with Tampa was the water access. So you had three things, anarchists, water surrounding the convention center, and CENTCOM, a military installation. So I think next time out, it's going to be difficult for coastal states or states with major military installations to land one of these conventions. Should they be shorter? They're probably going to be shorter. Each convention actually shrunk a bit, and it didn't seem to cause any problems. In fact, some Americans were happy. Uh, but nonetheless, what is happening is that broadcast television has decided all they can give for coverage is two hours of prime time, and it looks like they're getting less and less willing to do that. So I think we're going to see shorter conventions. And how much time between the conventions? We only had a week twice in a row now, 2008, 2012. They were back-to-back -back conventions. I thought I was going to die, but it was fun. 
Uh, in fact, I, was, I have to tell you a little aside. The great thing about being a college professor is one of my students ended up in law school in Charlotte. And he called me as, just as I'm getting on the plane from Tampa. He says, Professor, can you get me into the Democratic Convention? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm and anyway, we got him in. <laughs> and uh, he was so excited. He got his picture with Eva Longoria, so he didn't care about the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, the time between conventions is so short, and, and Republicans were really upset. They said there wasn't enough time, and they used that as one of the reasons why they said they didn't get a lot of bounce out of the convention, which they didn't. And of course, it has been the case for multi-years now that the incumbent party goes second. And second is always better because you tend to get more of a bounce than if you go first. So. Um, but I think that for coverage-wise, that there might be a reconsideration, maybe a little bit longer between the conventions. But it's something that's certainly being discussed about, and, and Florida was one of the contributors. You might say, well, what angle does Florida have on the presidential debates? Well, there were four debates, one vice presidential, three presidential. And they saved the best to last, of course. It was in Florida, in South Florida. but. Stepping back a little bit and thinking of Florida's diversity ideologically and partisan, from a partisan perspective, the debates did cause quite a bit of controversy. One was the moderators themselves became the story sometimes more than the debate itself. There was much discussion about the ideological bias in the selection of the moderators, where most of all the moderators came from more moderate liberal media outlets than from conservative. And so Florida's, particularly Republican leaders, were really complaining about the configuration of the moderators. And of course, one of the moderators interjected commentary into, and a, a, you know, conclusion about something into the mix itself. There's also a lot of debate as to whether the town hall format or the um, you know, moderator, single moderator, or a panel of journalists is best. By almost everyone's account, the worst format turned out to be the town hall format. The public was most disheartened by that because there was almost no interface between the town people in the, in the, in the town hall. Uh, the presidential candidates got off with each other. And uh, there was also, <coughs> a lot of people who were very controversially, you know, very argumentative about the, uh, how do I say it nicely? <laughs> the interface and the, the actions of the candidates themselves. So you had complaints that they were not serious, they weren't acting professional, that they were belittling the process. But the bottom line is, here is the real thing, Florida, was the story on what to expect out of the debates. Going into the debates, every national journalist was writing, these debates aren't going to matter one bit. The president is such a superior debater, and he was ahead at the polls by a lot at that time, by the time of the first debate. And of course, we knew better in Florida. We knew that people in Florida are more likely to pay attention to the debates and to tune in. Why? Because we're oversaturated with ads and whatever, and it's the only way that somebody can get a good look at the candidates in more than a 30-second soundbite or a 20-second spot in a regular newscast. And I wrote a column. I write for safetyreview.com. It's a political website, news aggregation site. I, I wrote ahead of this, I said, they're, they're wrong. Debates are going to matter to Americans. And they absolutely did. And if there was any controversy about what impact they can have, it was certainly clarified by things that we saw after the debates. Another really big controversy that is coming down the way again, everybody's heard of, the term, heard of Ron Paul. Now his son, Rand Paul, is already thinking about running in 2016. And he is a Republican right now, but who knows? 
But nonetheless, we did have a number of third party candidates running last time out, and they absolutely got not one bit of attention from the Commission on Presidential Debates about standing on the stage. You have to meet a 15% poll threshold to be on the stage. And for years, the CPD, the Congressional uh, Com Committee on Presidential Debates, kept trying to justify limiting two on a stage, saying, well, Americans can really focus better on two. Remember the slide I show you with nine on the stage? People had no problem with that. They like it. We're in a reality show mode. Let's narrow them down. You know, let's keep <laughs> excitement up. So, you know. And I think we'll have that issue revisited again about third party uh, candidates. And then, of course, the answer to the last one, we, if we were answering it based upon what we saw this last time, we would have to say, yes, debates can change the trajectory of the campaign. It did. From the first debate when everybody was shocked by Governor Romney really just um, slam dunking the president, the, Post-debate polls were never as clear um, as they were that night that one candidate won over the other. But after that, it was even up almost all the way in the key swing states. So it was at the time where the first debate, the president was way ahead, and then all of a sudden it was even up the rest of the way. Debates energized Republicans who were kind of de-energized after the conventions, and Democrats were energized after the second and third debate, so it was all steam ahead the rest of the way. Florida, again, got a lot of visits from the candidates and their surrogates um, because, again, one of the ways that you can tell the importance, swing states get more candidate visits than do the non-swing states. We were the state that had the second most candidate visits in the fall of 2012 next to Ohio. And you see in, in Florida, as in Ohio, in every single swing state with the exception of Wisconsin and New Hampshire, that actually Romney made more, Romney team made more visits to the swing states than the president himself. And I'll get to that. One of the reasons was a database that probably a lot of you have heard of by now. Another thing that we saw uh, in the candidate visits was an awareness of the changing demographics of the country. And of course, this shows you the difference in the ultimate demographics of who voted for Obama and who voted for Governor Romney. And you see, definitely, the president was reaching out. And when he chose where to go in Florida, this is really important. Because President Obama, Michelle Obama, Joe Biden to a lesser extent, but Bill Clinton, very importantly, where did they visit in Florida? They visited diverse areas and areas where there were a lot of younger voters who are themselves much more racially and ethnically diverse than their older counterparts. And this is going to be very important because this is what exactly the Republicans know to be the case. This is projecting forward nationally the changing makeup, particularly the, the rapid growth of, a, of the Hispanic population, and also you can see even the Asian population is projected to pretty much double by the next time out. And so they, they project that by 2050, as you see here, that whites will not be a majority of America's population. So both parties know that they have to reach this younger demographic, which is liberal, secular, and more likely to be registered as independent but to vote Democratic. So it's quite interesting what challenges uh, we have ahead of us. So the questions for 2016, will the Republicans pay more attention to diversity? The answer, we're starting to already see the answer is they have to. And one of the things that was also interesting about the coverage of the conventions, how many of you watched at least some of each of them? OK, great. I knew you would say yes. This is. My college students, well, sort of, you know. In my classes, yes, but. Uh, what was really telling was the split screens. You know how, and you had one split screen, and I, let, I'm going to say we're, we're in Charlotte, we're the newscasters, and we've got a split screen 
with a shot of the delegates to the Charlotte Convention, and then they'll quickly put next to it a shot of the delegates at the Republican Convention. And the image that it projected of one being more inclusive and whatever was very damaging to Republicans. And I don't think next time out you're going to see the same kind of inattention to delegate diversity at the Republican convention that you saw this time out. Split screens can be very, very effective when they're used to project images and so forth. And of course, next time out, President Obama will most likely be a surrogate on the campaign trail. And of course, right now, the parlor game is a Hillary versus Joe Biden match up. We don't know, but you know, the day after the election, we were on to 2016. <laughs> so the question mark is just, this is just kind of fun. Would President Obama go with Biden or go with Hillary or what, you know? And there's a lot of speculation that one of the, um, you know, promises that Bill Clinton might have gotten out of the president was if his wife does run that he'll be out there campaigning. But think of it, we could have some very interesting uh, husband and wife teams on the campaign trail next to out as surrogates or in, in general. And the next question, will the same states be swing states in 2016? Probably not, but one we know will, and you're sitting in it, it will be a swing state. Well, what's fascinating is the Hispanic growth has prompted nationally Democrats to put money now into Texas. They really feel that not, maybe not 2016, but another couple of election cycles that they can turn Texas blue, which is, I lived in Texas for 10 years. I don't know, but it's interesting. But let me tell you one thing. If you think it's expensive to campaign in Florida, it's expensive to campaign in Texas. It's a bit bigger state and it has a lot more media markets even than us. So let's move on to the next phase. We've started out with the primary, we've been to the conventions, we've been to the debates. The real game is always the ground game. How you get people to the polls. And here we see a stark difference between what the Democrats and Republicans did in 2012 that's created a lot of, of questions this, uh, coming up. First of all, ads. You see that more money was spent on television ads in Florida than any other place. $173 million. So, you know, if you're wondering why you got a little bit, you know, your mute button got a bit worn during the campaign, <laughs> now you know. But a new study just came out. I was here and I happened to look on my iPad. I was waiting a little bit and a new study just got released this afternoon. This is the money spent. But a new study out today which calculated the number of ads that were run, three million ads between January 1st and November 2nd at a cost of $2 billion. Television stations loved it. So did pollsters and ad people who did all the work up to get these. It was record breaking. It was a 33% increase in the number of ads this year, well, 2012, over 2008. And the cost of ads went up 81%. So, and they weren't nice, most of them, either. Um, there's different accounts, but around one estimate is 85% of the ads run by both candidates were, were or close to it, were negative. Uh, this study came out right now that says that, you know, 64% um, were purely negative which is a little bit different. Some of the 85 would be somewhat negative, so whatever. That has a meaning, as we'll see in a little bit, too. This is interesting, and it definitely is already projected to be something that we'll probably see some changes in in 2016. The Pew Research Center, which does wonderful polling, they were one of the most accurate polling firms in the country for both who was going to win and a lot of other things, they historically do an after-election survey, and you can see here that the conclusion is that the debates were more helpful than the commercials. And we certainly affirm this. You could have just looked at Florida and come to this same conclusion. 
And in terms of the negativeness of it, the top ad was run by the president and the bottom ad was run by Romney. So they were each critiquing each other uh, negatively. You saw very, very few positive ads whatsoever out of either campaign. And of course, if you look at what America thought of all this, the grades weren't too high. And you see that we, between 2008 campaign and 2012, a lot more people thought that there was less discussion of the issues. And I would have to agree with that as an analyst looking at it. And secondly, no surprise, 68% thought that there was more than usual negative campaigning and mudslinging. Yes. But then when you look at the grades that Americans gave for their performance, average grades, C plus, the president, the pollsters, the campaign consultants, and the voters, C plus. The Romney campaign is C, but look who is the, the, gets the lowest ratings, the press. And it was true in the middle of the campaign, poll was done, and um, again, a reputable polling. 60% of Americans said they had no faith in the national media to be accurate and fair and informative about what was going on in the election. Now the story comes back to these late deciders. 8% of Americans made up their mind within a week. In Florida, it was 8% made up their mind the weekend before the election or the day of. And you're scratching your head and you're saying, how in the world can somebody not know who they're going to vote for in Florida where you've already seen the oversaturation of ads that we had, et cetera? Well, here's the answer. And this is why Obama, in the end, was able to pull ahead in the finish line in Florida in a photo finish election. The 8% are almost all women, young voters, 18 to 29, and minority voters, particularly younger and female minority voters, as we'll see. And this is pretty evident of the fact that there was a generational divide. This, to me, is one of the biggest stories of the election that got virtually not much attention and should have. And we saw it right here in Florida. This is a trend. Think of it. Florida, we saw it. I was seeing it in polls from the moment I started looking at polls, and I always look at the age breaks. We could see it every step of the way in our state. And uh, it turned out to be that way as well nationally. And here's what I was talking about. If you look at just the 18 to 29-year-olds nationally, and it would have been very similar in Florida, you can see that the strongest support, and these are the millennials, are women of color, the Hispanic and black or African-American females, were much more likely than their male counterparts to vote for the president. And you might ask yourself, this is really interesting, because again, we see it in Florida universities. It's because more young college students are women than men. And the gap is particularly wide within the minority communities. So this was not terribly surprising in a way. But it is interesting that if you were to ask yourself, what is the most Democratic voting cohort in Florida and nationally today? It's 18 to 29 year olds. The millennial generation is at almost, I think maybe even a slightly bigger than the boomers. The two big age groups are those two. And their politics couldn't be more different. They're very different. And now you have to say the most solidly democratic voting bloc, again, 18 to 29 year olds. Think of it in less than 10 years time, 10 years ago, that would have been the 65 and older portion of Florida and nationally. So you ask yourself, what's happening here? And this is where a lot of the pollsters went wrong. They forgot about something called generational replacement. You've got to look at Older people dying off and going to glory. We'll give everybody a plus on that one. And, uh, and, and this is where polling in Florida was really off because it was very inaccurate within the Cuban population in South Florida, where historically that Hispanic group has voted heavily Republican. 
But the last couple of election cycles, that younger cohort of Cubans has been definitely moving more towards Democrats. Why? Because they don't care so much about foreign policy in Castro. So, you know, we now know as social scientists and pollsters, we got to pay a lot more attention. So here we get into some big questions. Is it better to run your ads, a lot of them earlier or later? Obama ran early, Romney later. We don't know if that pattern will hold up. Do negative ads cause lower turnout? This one is causing alarm on both parties because the answer is yes, it did this time. Turnout went down 4% in Florida. It went down nationally. Many blame the oversaturation of ads and the inability of parties at the end to get people to, to the polls, except for the Democrats who figured out younger college students could be gotten to the polls by other young people who were community organizers and embeds. And then, of course, is it better to spend more on TV ads or on databases? Obama had the database to die for. Republicans did not. They both had massive databases to help mobilize voters in early voting at the end. But the Obama campaign spent anywhere from 225 to 250 million dollars constructing a database which knows just about everything about every one of you in here. It is very, very detailed. And just to give you an example of what the discussion is right now, Republicans have already said next time out they know that they have to get a more sophisticated database and they're probably going to spend more on that than they are on television ads. And again, Florida contributed a lot to this discussion. Campaign finance reform, probably some of you are saying, are we? Probably not going to see any reform. This was the most expensive election in presidential history. Six billion dollar election. And you can see compared to, to 5.3 billion in 08, a billion dollars in outside spending through PACs. Here's a look at the spending. Uh, this was presidential candidates. This would have been all of them. Democrats, 739 million roughly, and Republicans, 625 million. You can see the amount raised and so forth. In terms of big donors, rich people in Florida, we see we're a state that contributes a lot to presidential candidates. Here's a look at the PACs that were very influential and spent a lot of money. Uh, both sides left a lot of the negativism, especially early on, to the PACs. Each side ended up with about the same percentage of money coming from PACs. Florida was the fourth largest state in terms of contributing money to campaigns. And when you look at it, Florida ranks six in terms of money given to Democrats. And for uh, Republicans, Florida ranked, um, let's see, where is it here? third in terms of money to, to, Democrat, to Republicans. So we are a very big donor state. Would Americans like to limit the money spent on campaigns? Yes. Do they think there should be limits on corporations, unions, and other organizations? Yes, 83%. Would they like to know who's paying for political ads? Yes. But are we going to see any change in the Citizens United court ruling, which allows all these things to happen? Perhaps if we have some members of the Supreme Court resign or whatever, but that's a, a long shot. It is not going to come from any congressional reform, I can assure you that. It's like the foxes guarding the hen house, and they're not going to change this. Will we see super PACs forced to release the names of contributors? Many reformers would like that. They believe Americans have a right to transparency. But in terms of betting on it, I think it's up in the air, but I'm probably a little bit negatively, come down a bit negative on that. Election reform, I don't need to tell you Florida affected the nation on this one. When we changed our early voting lines, we had long lines. We were out there on election night with not the answer in. Election reform was a big part of it. It was not, however, photo IDs in Florida as it was in a lot of other states. We have a fairly liberal photo ID law. It was, in fact, the long lines, the changing of the early voting, and some of the registration changes, which led to, of course, causes of voter suppression, claims of voter suppression. You see, nationally, there wasn't a lot of complaint about problems with the voting process, 
73% said it was managed pretty well where they live. Uh, but on the other hand, we have seen a constant decline in the amount of people who say that they're confident that votes are being accurately counted. Americans still don't like the Electoral College. We ain't changing it. Every four years, the party that loses wants to reform the Electoral College, and the one that wins say it's just fine, so I don't think we're going to see much there. <laughs> Will we see voting online? Probably not, with cybersecurity issues escalating. In fact, younger voters will tell you more than anybody else they're a little bit nervous about online voting. <laughs> Will we see national legislation on things like time limits on voting and so forth? It, we may, because the president has made that a big part of his inaugural address and also in his State of the Union address. Will we see more prosecution of election fraud? Um, perhaps, but the press doesn't seem to give a lot of attention to election fraud. And of course, another thing, we can't even know or think that what we see now with media is going to end up being the same. This last election, you can see that it's still true that television is king, but you see the increase in getting news online and through mobile sources. And have we seen people change their media habits again? The internet is going close up. Television stations, I can assure you, are very nervous that they're going to be obsolete. They're worried about a business model right now. It'll be a few years yet, but they have that on their minds. Campaign news sources, this was uh, done in October. Cable news followed by local news. Americans trust local news more than anyone else. And in fact, that's why the candidates prefer to be interviewed by a local news reporter or anchor than on Meet the Press or some kind of national program. Media bias, Americans think so. Republicans more than Democrats, but there's a little bit of concern and it's escalating the fairness of the press. As I mentioned before, we saw this last election and we haven't seen any signs of this dissipating yet. The Americans' distrust in media is at an all-time high. So what are we looking at ahead for 2016? Are we going to have more pay-per-view news sites on the web? Because newspapers are already moving this direction. Are we going to have more or less celebrity focus? We really didn't have that much this time compared to 2008, but things could change. Will there be more or less convergence of media platforms, meaning the same media organization owns television stations, newspapers, radio, etc.? And will social media replace traditional media? And the answer is probably for uh, some of the younger old, but in general, uh, definitely for young. So I'm going to end with this. We're already talking about 2016. You can see the big questions and you get a great feel for why Florida has played and will play such an important part in national presidential politics. And I like to end every one of my talks by saying I am so delighted that I am a political scientist in Florida and not North Dakota. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Any questions? By the way, in case you're wondering who the bottom three are, you see two of them are Floridians, Jeb Bush and Marco, and then the fat guy in the middle is the governor of New Jersey, so. Um, I've done quite a bit of analysis of our county voter data over the past 15 years, and when early voting came along, one of the first things I noticed was that it was more heavily utilized by Democrats than Republicans. Uh, I can't recall his name, but during this past election season, I think I saw a fellow on national TV who had written a book on elections who said this was a national phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, uh, is it, would you agree that anyone in Tallahassee who was reducing early voting would have to have known that it would reduce Democratic voting more than Republican voting? You might have thought that, but let me tell you, the laws of unintended consequences are often also proven in Florida because what happened was vote suppression discussion actually increased minority turnout in Florida. And it was really interesting, particularly among the African-American populations, there was concern 
that their proportion of the voting public would have gone down a bit, particularly among some older, very religious African Americans over the gay marriage issue. All it took was discussion that they might lose the voting rights that they worked hard for, sacrificed for, and they were at the polls. Gay marriage no longer was an issue. For the younger blacks, it was really interesting. I have a personal story there from one of my, uh, person who does my makeup for television because they call me the cosmetically impaired professor. I can't do that kind of stuff. <laughs> but anyway, the young woman who does it is African American and her husband's a minister. And uh, one day, the day of souls to the polls, which is the Sunday where a lot of church people are, are uh, encouraged to go vote. Uh, she said that her husband had to be a guest minister, so she decided she would go to a very young um, African-American church with a lot of 18 to 29-year-olds. And what she told me was really fascinating, but it shows the superiority of the Obama campaign in figuring out where they had to go and so forth, because at that, at that service was a preacher from the 19th Street Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. And his message was all about the sacrifices that these young blacks elders had made for them to have the right to vote. Because younger voter was, you know, it was iffy as to whether we would have an increase in younger voters, but I, it, it absolutely happened. So voter suppression talk was very mobilizing for younger voters. And let's face it, it was younger voters who in the end pull Florida across the finish line for the president. And in fact, the biggest surprise to every single analyst in the country, doesn't matter where, was the fact that young voter turnout went up this time instead of down. No one, no model, no nothing had predicted that. What did it? That superior database that the Democrats had they were running 66,000 statistical models every single night, pinpointing exactly where there was softening points, sending in a big surrogate speaker like Michelle Obama or Bill Clinton or the president himself. And you could see that particular model absolutely employed in Florida. So, sure. Uh, yes, and the uh, early voting, do you see that states that have early voting uh, have a larger turnout than states that do not have early voting? The answer is no. No, they, there's not a lot of evidence that early voting increases and expands turnout. It just means people change their minds about when they're going to vote. There's not, not a lot of uh, academic evidence to suggest that it... So, so you don't see that uh, there'll be an effect, uh, the, there will be an effect of influencing states that have voting only on election day going to early voting? Well, I think that you've seen that trend in general, but it's not because of turnout. It's because for a lot of supervisors of elections, you know, being able to spread it out over a number of days makes an election more manageable. Uh, and let's, let's also make sure that we understand that when you say early voting, there's two kinds. There's in-person early voting, and there's absentee voting, which is also a form of early voting. And you were right, the gentleman that asked the earlier question, Democrats were much higher turnout and using the in-person early voting, whereas Republicans had a higher use of absentee voting. And that's been a pattern that's, you know, we've seen for a while, but the Democrats, again, really from a statistical, uh, from a strategic perspective, really emphasized early voting in person because here's what happened. It was very, very strategic. If you voted early and you're, you know, everyone knows that as public information. So what happened was clever pollsters got a list of all the people that voted early and phoned them and Democratic pollsters did that and then publicized the data showing how much difference there was in Democratic support, you know, the voters voting earlier for the president and then for Romney. And it became then a mobilizing get out the vote strategy for Democrats. So you can poll people who vote early and it was used very, very effectively in key swing states. Florida, of course, one and Ohio, the other big one. Same thing happened. Do we have time for one more question? <coughs> pick one, I can't, you pick. 
Yes, I have read that there was a difference in, I may not remember the number correctly, 1.4 million voters in, for House of Representatives more voted for Democrats than Republicans, and the difference, the reason the House of Representatives is still in Republican hands was uh, effective gerrymandering. I'm wondering whether you think the constitutional amendment we passed mm -hmm. prohibiting, supposedly prohibiting that kind of thing, really made a difference in Florida. Yes, it did. Uh, Democrats picked up four congressional seats. They picked up five seats in the uh, Florida House of Representatives, and I think three in the Senate, somewhere thereabout. And yes, it did make a difference. But the problem that people don't understand about redistricting is that increasingly people tend to move where there are others who share their ideology and politics. And this is the problem with redistricting. The public is not evenly distributed across the entire geography of a state. It would be very difficult to draw, for example, a Democratic district in Naples. Naples is one of the most Republican. <laughs> it would be very difficult to draw a Republican district in Broward County. So, you know, this is the thing, and, um, but yes, it was the case that Florida did better as a consequence of the Fair Districts Amendments. Now, would, would Democrats liked it to have looked even better? And we still, of course, have a couple live lawsuits about the issue, so it's not totally resolved. Thank you for sharing Valentine's with me. Thank you.